After the Dragon spacecraft does arrive at the station and the hatches are open, the crews on board are going to start to unload the cargo that's inside. Now, the largest portion of that cargo is food and crew provisions, but there is science experiment hardware in there as well. We're going to find out this morning more about those, uh, that cargo and other news regarding space station science from Dr. Tara Rutley, the International Space Station's Assistant Associate Program Scientist. Got it. Associate Program Scientist. The only science payloads inside this spaceship are coming from a dozen groups of school kids. Uh, yeah. Tell me about the Student Spaceflight Experiment Program. Sure. How cool is that, right? Um, I know that the students who are watching this whole SpaceX demo launch and, and watching their payload go, uh, must be super, super thrilled um, beyond anything probably that a science fair could even <laughs> do for them. But um, so this is a program that's uh, sponsored jointly actually by the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education and um, the NanoRacks, the company NanoRacks, commercial company. And so it's uh, as part of a student competition, and this is the first of its kind that's going to stay on station, although this program has a history of launching two, I think, two previous student uh, investigations on a NanoRacks module uh, on the shuttle missions. So what NanoRacks is, it's, it's a small laboratory, basically a very mini laboratory, that can get launched to station and can live on station, and, you know, you basically plug and play these experiments and they can do their thing while they're up in microgravity. And so NanoRacks and um, the program partnered and put out a call for proposals for students uh, last year, I think it was last fall, to compete, you know, compete in design and create a proposal as, as to basically what do you think you might see um, in terms of changes um, in experiments in microgravity. So students from across the nation participated. There were nearly 800 proposals that were uh, submitted from the students, and it, and it basically reached out to about, that, it, that involved about 3,500 students actually participating in experimental design in a way that uh, was different, because when you're creating a new experiment for, for space station, you have to take gravity out of the equation, and that's right. a complete challenge. So uh, after two grueling rounds of, um, of uh, selection processes from top-notch researchers all over the country. Uh, they all came together at the Air and Space Museum um, at the Smithsonian in DC and selected the finalists. And the finalists were uh, representing, um, there were 12 communities representing nine states, including and, and the District of Columbia, uh, to basically get their experiment launched on station and, and get to sit on station for a while to see what they can come up with. So what, did the, what are the winners investigating? So the winners are investigating a wide range of things. And when I read through these, I'm, I'm like, this is super cool. Because the thing about the students' uh, experiments is, you know, it, some of them are complete shots in the dark. You don't know what you don't know. So right. basic discovery and a chance that, hey, I want to see how some of this stuff comes out. So um, one of them is investigating uh, grape fermentation in space. So uh, they've got a ground control, and they and they flew a, a setup on, on the space station where they're looking at, um, they're going to measure carbon dioxide production rates. Uh, and so this sample needs to come home so they can compare their, their flown sample to the ground and see which 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 part ferments faster, the one in space or the one on the ground? Uh, there's another one uh, looking at the parathyroid uh, effects of parathyroid hormone on uh, the growth of bone cells. Oh. There's another one which is really cool. They're gonna send dormant killfish eggs up to station, rehydrate them on station, and watch them develop and get the samples back and look at how those samples have developed in space. Pretty cool stuff, right? How I, old are these students? Man, they they range from fifth grade all the way to I believe there is a community college involvement as well, and the uh, and now there's even a university four four year universities who can participate in the upcoming missions as well. But I, you know, I've I got online um, when these came up and I kind of started investigating these myself, and I've seen what happens is when these students get their samples back and complete their analysis, they all come to a conference at the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian and DC and they stand on stage and they have their presentation and they give their final results like a, at a, like you would at a scientific conference. So I'm watching these fifth graders who I would have never done what they had done in, in fifth grade. You know, my science fair projects were never as cool. So, uh, so they take it from beginning, from experimental design to implementation to completing the analysis and communicating the results. And so uh, even at a fifth grade level, I'll, you know, that's insanely cool. Very to sophisticated experiments yeah. For, yeah. for students. Yeah, that age. definitely. Along with designing them originally, in, 
these students also had to redesign some of their experiments, or at least consider redesign, because they were originally going to fly on a different spacecraft. Yep. And so they had, to, they had to look at redoing it, just like you would have to maybe redo things in real life. Um, how helpful is that for them? That's right. It's the real world. That's how helpful it is. Um, and, and, and analogous to that, every scientist who ever does any investigation the first time around, it never comes out the first time, right? So science is an iterative process. Now when you're talking about space flight, it's, it's a completely uniquely iterative process. And just like our scientists, our investigators on the full-time space station have, these students met the challenge um, of, you know, when they, were still, when they were early in the selection process, these students were told, they were realized that their projects couldn't be refrigerated in transport from Houston to Kazakhstan and then couldn't be um, uh, refrigerated in the Soyuz that they were planning to launch these experiments in. So the students were asked to go back and reevaluate their experiments and see if they could do without refrigeration. Um, and then they were, there were three subsequent experiments who couldn't do without refrigeration, so, um, so they were, uh, their alternates were selected. And so the students were moving forward with those um, investigations, preparing them for launch on Soyuz. And right. then in January, Soyuz had a pressurization test fail, which then again impacted their flight. And as a result of all that, NASA moved these, this investigational payload to the historic, now SpaceX, demo launch, which um, which is really cool because it provides cold cold stowage capability. So not only did the alternates get to fly, the three alternates, but the original three that Still. needed refrigeration also got to fly. So now instead of 12 experiments going up, we have 15. And so everyone's satisfied and they, the students get to participate in a historic launch to space station and the first commercial cargo vehicle to dock uh, from the U.S. So. Do all of them come back? Do they all have to have samples that have to come back to be uh, to be examined? Not all of them need to come back to have samples. Uh, the majority of them do, and that's also critical for our investigators. And that's why we, we are excited about SpaceX because SpaceX represents our, our nation's capability now of getting any kind of return of samples from space station. And so, um, although these investigations won't come back on space station, uh, won't come back uh, on SpaceX, they'll come back later on Soyuz. We do need the, the samples samples returned. So um, they want to look at, you know, how the fish developed. Mm -hmm. The returns capabilities, uh, the return requirements, I should say, of these experiments don't require refrigeration. So they are going to come back on a Soyuz. But in general, SpaceX, uh, in terms of science, we're excited because those will, that will require code storage capabilities. We'll get that in the future. There will be other kids in the future that will get this opportunity? Yeah. So they just completed a second round of selection for the Mission 2, because this is called Mission 1 to Station. Mission 2 is going to be a launch to station in the fall, so those have been selected. And just at the end of April, there's been another call for proposals uh, for students who are interested in flying Mission 3. And Mission 3 is expected to launch in uh, the spring of next year. So there's one opportunity after another. And from what I've read, uh, this program makes it really, really, um, I wouldn't say easy because you still have to compete. Yeah. But if you're interested, they accept all proposals, all ideas from across the range. So nothing is off the table. And they do their best to accommodate and get you up there if you're selected. So they really, really have um, a serious stake in this for the students. And pff, I can't wait to see the results that come back, frankly. And on another topic, it was three years ago, just next week, by the time that Expedition 20 began, right. when the station expanded to a full-time crew of six people. Have you seen a significant change in the amount of science work that crew members are, are, are getting through since the crew size has doubled? Yes, a significant change. Our office has kept really, really busy. I've been in the office for three years, right around when that point started, and I've seen uh, the capabilities increase in the, in the number of crew hours. In fact, if I had to, to couch it, I'd say a little over two times as much as getting done on station in terms of research from the crew. Um, and our office is over two times as is busy and we're all excited so I know I've seen it firsthand the ramp up of the of the number of investigations the quality of the investigations the organization of the investigations and the communication with the principal investigators so it's been a real exciting three years is, is there a way to, to characterize the quality of 
that increased quantity? Yeah, everybody wants to know, you know, what station doing for, for us? And it's hard to characterize the quality because it the results keep coming in in different areas. So human health, earth observation, and um, education, and you know materials improvements, and 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 now that assembly is complete and we're facing full-time use of station, um, the results come in piece by piece, and we do our best to communicate them. And each one has its own value to the public, and so um, so really, I think what we're going to look ahead towards is the next eight years of utilization. We're in the decade of utilization. So even in that first 10 years of assembly, we did get amazing results. They're trickling in just from that first 10 years, even though we were busy with assembly. And it's just like Apollo. We're still seeing results from Apollo. Mm -hmm. So hard to characterize all of that. They're just still coming in. Um, we are on our office definitely get a grasp of all the, the super cool results that keep coming in, and we're busy compiling them and communicating them and, uh, and, and you know, making sure the public knows how they're, uh, they're beneficial to them as well. There's an event coming up soon that yeah. uh, you're going to do that to, uh, to give everybody a chance to learn more about science. Tell us about the, the uh, Space Station Research and Development Conference in June. Yeah, right? it's pretty much a dream event for investigators who have ever done or wanted to do anything in space. Um, it is a conference that will be June 26th through the 28th in Denver, uh, sponsored, co-sponsored by uh, CASIS, the National Laboratory uh, uh, Management Office, and the uh, American Astronautical Society. And it's the first ever conference where we'll pull together all of the major uh, principal investigators involved in major results on space station, not just to say, look what I did, look what benefits you, although certainly we want to hear the benefits, but also to share lessons learned, right? In science, you really want to be able to, to talk about what worked and what didn't work. Mm -hmm. And in space, there's a lot that doesn't work, and we want to be able to communicate that. We'll also have an opportunity in that uh, meeting to bring on a potential new investigators. So if you're a new investigator, you're thinking about doing something on space station, there are workshops that are going to be held there. Uh, to tell you how to do it. So it's uh, it's going to be a pretty busy, amazing, wonderfully um, uh, learning uh, experience at this conference. So I think uh, if you're interested, you should definitely get out there. That's late June in Denver. Yes. Is there a, a website where people who are interested can... Yes. I believe it's www.astronautical.org. And then, then, if you're interested in getting your student experiment up as part of the SSEP program, you should go to, let's see if I get this right, ssep.ncesse.org. And if you missed that, if you Google SSEP, it's the first thing that pops up mm -hmm. at the top of your search list. So. Sure, you could go to nasa.gov and go to Space Station in the Science section That's and, right. and find the addresses Always as well. Always come visit us in the Science section. We're there. Okay. Yes. Tara, thanks very much. Thank you. Dr. Tara Rutley is the International Space Station's Associate Program Scientist.